is when designing a system, choosing the correct database at the outset of the project is crucial to the project's overall success. Now, the choice of the database should align with your project's data structure and requirements, where different databases are designed for specific data models. So we have relational DBs, we have document DBs, we have caches, we also have graph databases. And selecting the wrong type can lead to inefficiencies and complexities in data handling. Now, choosing the database should also support your project's scalability needs because scalability can play a major factor in the long-term success of your application. So some databases are better suited for horizontal scalability while others are optimized for vertical scalability. So increasing the resources of a single server, both of which we are going to be looking at. So take for example, you spend months building an application with one type of database and realized after the build and live deployment that this particular database doesn't allow for complex querying. And the only alternative is to migrate to a database that does. So this is no longer functional for our requirements. So we have to migrate all the data. So the logic within the web server now needs to point to this new relational DB. The data from the non-relational DB has to be migrated over to the relational database. Now this migration incurs not only time and resource costs, but also opportunity costs. And this essentially underscores the critical importance of making the right database choice from the outset. So with that being said, let's focus our attention on one of the most fundamental types of databases, relational databases. So relational database is a type of database management system that is designed to store, organize, and manage data in a structured tabular format using a model known as the relational model. So what does this mean? Well, the data within this type of database is going to be stored as tables with each table representing a specific entity or type of data. And then each row in a table represents an individual data entry, while columns define attributes, right? Now the data itself is well-defined for structured data. So this is the customer's table schema, where the data is organized into well-defined categories with predefined schemas, unlike in the non-relational counterpart, which we'll look at in the next video. So right here, we have customer table schema. So this might be quite hard to read because we have a lot on the screen, but we'll go through it. So we have the customer ID, which is this field here. Within this schema, we have specified the type. So in this case, it's an integer, and we've also specified that it's not null. This cannot be null. We have first name, last name, email, and address. First name, last name, and email are all of type string, and they are all set to not null. So none of these fields can ever be null. And then lastly, we have address, which is string. Now in this example, this field can be set to null, but in a real world scenario, when you have customer details, you're gonna to wanna to set this to not null. But this is just here as an example schema. So we'll take this as it can be null. Now let's go into more depth in these. So as you can see with each of these tables, we have a column which has PK next to it. Now what PK stands for, is it stands for the primary key. So this is a column within a table that uniquely identifies each row in a table. So this serves as a unique identifier for the records within that table, ensuring that no two rows have the same values in the primary keys. And like we said, the primary key is always not null. And this establishes data integrity within each table. So now we know what these tables are and what they're comprised of, rows and columns. How is this table going to communicate with this table in order to create some complex queries? because that's what relational DBs allow. And this is where we use foreign keys. Now foreign keys specified by FK within these tables. So as you can see here, here, and here, these create relationships between the data in the tables where the foreign key is defined. So the foreign key references essentially the child table, whereas the primary key references the parent table. Now the purpose of a foreign key is to maintain referential integrity and enforce data consistency between related tables. So for example, in the customer table, customer ID is the primary key being the parent table, whereas in the order table, customer ID is the foreign key being in the child table. So this is how tables communicate with one another. So now we know what relational databases are and what they comprise of. How would we as clients query them in order to retrieve data stored in these tables within a relational database? Well, for this, we have what's known as SQL. So the querying language. Now this is solely for managing and manipulating relational databases, which is why relational databases are used synonymously with SQL databases. Now, this lesson is not an in-depth discussion on SQL, but in order to know how relational databases are queried, we definitely need to shed some light on it. So let's look at a few examples. So we have SQL query one and SQL query two. These are very bog standard, very simple. So what we have here is a select statement. We have this asterisk here, which just means select all from, and we're specifying the table of customers. And here we have a where clause. 
So this specifies the conditions that this query needs to meet to retrieve information from customers. So where email is like algo.js, and this percent sign here is a wildcard. Suggests that anything with an email beginning with algo.js and anything afterwards should be returned within this query. Very simple, very straightforward. In this SQL query, it's very similar. We are selecting all from the customer table. But in this case, we're just going to order by the email and we're going to do it in an ascending fashion. Now, these are just two very simple queries. We can start carrying out more powerful queries and join tables together to give us more fine grained results. So take, for example, this. This is slightly more complex. So we're specifying here that we want to select from customer table, the customer ID, the first name, the last name. We want to select from orders table, order ID in order date. And this is going to be from customers. We're specifying an inner join. So in the two tables, we have an overlap of data, which is this segment here. And we only want that data. And we are going to join on customer ID. So here, we're just specifying what to join on. We could also use using instead, which is slightly more concise, but I feel like this is suitable enough. And then we specify the where clause. So where customers, customer ID is equal to algo.js and order date is greater than 30th of the 6th, 2023. So like we said, the inner join is used to combine data from customers and orders table based on the customer ID column, establishing a relationship between customers and their orders. And this is only just scratching the surface. Now, database queries are complex enough in themselves. Take, for example, this simple query. We're just selecting all from customers where email is equal to example, 123 at gmail.com. Now, from the data structures and algorithms course, we know that doing a search through an entire array is going to produce a linear time complexity. And with a SQL table, it's going to be the exact same. We're going to have to sequentially examine each row to find the one with the specified email address. So in worst case, it's going to be O of N. Now, if this table gets extremely large, so greater than a mil, this is especially common in distributed systems, this is going to become an inefficient process. So here within this table, what we can do is add what's known as an index on the email column so when we add indexes, we usually look in the where clause. So if we add an index on email, what this index is going to do is it's essentially going to create a new data structure, the equivalent of a new table. And this improves the speed of the data retrievals operational on the table. And what it does is it acts like a big pointer, pointing to the corresponding rows within the table. Now, this index within relational DBs would typically use, say, a balanced tree-based index structure, such as a B tree, which we're not going to go into depth on, but it's going to reduce the time complexity to log in, which is a significant improvement, avoiding a full table scan. However, indexes themselves are not silver bullets when it comes to optimizing database queries. There are limitations. So firstly, indexes consume storage space. So like here, we have created a new table. Right. So there's extra storage, and this can be a concern, especially when dealing with large tables or when numerous indexes are created. They can also slightly slow down write operations. So say if we have to insert into the table or we have to update or even delete when data is modified within this table, the index must also be updated to reflect the changes. So just remember, it's important to choose the right columns for indexing and over indexing can lead to increased storage and maintenance costs, while under indexing can result in suboptimal query performance. Now, one of the main features of relational databases that we need to discuss is that they support what's called ACID properties. And this stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And these apply primarily to transactions. And transactions are a fundamental concept in database management systems. They allow multiple database operations to be grouped and treated as a single indivisible unit of work. So in order to understand both of these, let's look at an example. So let's consider a scenario where a customer places an order. So T1 up here is the transaction. Now the transaction involves, as we said, multiple steps or operations. So one is going to create a new order within the order table. It's going to update the order details table based on the order. It's also going to decrement the count of the product within the products table. And if the customer hasn't already signed up, well then it's going to add that customer within the customers table. So this single transaction is going to carry out four operations. So the transaction is being processed. We add the new customer, we update the order table, we add the order details, and we also update the products table by decrementing the amount of smartphones. Now these operations, like we said, are grouped into this single transaction. And if any part of this transaction fails, say we couldn't add the customer table within here, or we couldn't decrement the value of the product within the products table. In that case, the entire transaction fails. So the entire transaction is rolled back to the previous state. So each one of these are removed from the tables. And this ensures that either all the operations within the transactions are completed successfully or none of them are executed. And this is the application 
of the atomicity property. So the order record in the order table is created in a consistent manner with the schema. So we've created a customer ID. This needs to be not null. Same with first name, last name, email. Address can be null, but in this case, we are actually going to add an address. So let's say it's 19 Lakeside. So this ensures that all the fields are populated correctly. The products inventory ensures that the quantity of ordered products is subtracted from the available stock. So that's exactly what we've done here. So this maintains consistency in the inventory data and the recording of the order itself follows a consistent format in logging its data. And these are all examples of how a transaction ensures consistency. Bringing the database from one consistent state to another. Any changes made during the transaction adhere to integrity constraints and data rules defined by the database schemas, which we discussed on the other page. Now, say we had multiple users performing transactions for products concurrently at the same time. We have T2, we have T3. Their respective transactions will not interfere with T1's transactions. Each transaction appears to run independently and doesn't affect the consistency or integrity of the data in the other transactions. And this is the isolation property. Transactions are isolated from each other. And we'll go into more depth on isolation in just a second. Now, once the customer places an order and the transaction is successfully committed, the effects of the transaction are permanent. Even in the event of a system failure, so say like a server crashes or there's a power outage, the change made by the committed transaction, such as the creation of the order and the update of the product inventory, this will not be lost. And this is the durability aspect, ensuring that the committed transactions are stored securely and can survive system failures. So just to conclude, atomicity, this is where the entire set of operations is treated as a single atomic unit. And if any part fails, the entire transaction is rolled back. Consistency, the operation ensures data consistency and adheres to the database rules and constraints. Isolation is where concurrent transactions are isolated from each other to prevent interference and maintain data integrity. And then durability, where committed transactions are stored durably and their effects are permanent. Now, there are many nuances to transactions that would take hours to go through. But I feel like for system design interviews, knowing ACID properties is one of the main features, but there is also isolation levels within transactions that provide much more versatility. So let's discuss this at a high level. So isolation levels just determine the visibility and behavior of data during concurrent transactions. So specifying the degree of isolation and consistency provided to transactions. So the four levels we're going to look at are read uncommitted, read committed, repeatable reads, and serializable levels. So firstly, there is read uncommitted. So this level of isolation, transactions have the lowest level of isolation. So it allows for transactions to read data that has been modified, but not yet committed by another transaction. So say for example, T1 is being processed and it's updating the price of product 201 and it's updating it to a thousand. It's added that within the table, but T1 also has to carry out numerous operations. So it's going off and carrying out the other operations. T2 begins its process and T2 also needs to look at the price of product 201 and it reads 1000, even though T1 is not committed yet. So if T1 is rolled back, so this is not committed, the change made by transaction two may be based on uncommitted data, resulting in what's known as a dirty read. And this is where a transaction reads stale data. So this is the lowest level of isolation, but it provides the highest degree of concurrency. So read uncommitted, this level offers the highest degree of concurrency, but the lowest data integrity and consistency. So it's susceptible to things like dirty reads, non-repeatable reads, and phantom reads. Next up, we have read committed. Now in read committed isolation level, transactions can only read data that has been committed by other transactions. So take the same example as before. So transaction one is in operation. It updates product 201. It updates its price to 1000. Now T1 hasn't been committed and it goes off to carry out its other operations. T2 is in flight it's in operation. It goes to read product 201's price, but with read committed, T2 can only read the committed price of product 201. So it can only see the original price because T1's change has not been committed. Now this level of isolation prevents dirty reads, but transaction two might get a different result if it queries the price again, because transaction one could commit the change in the meantime. And this is known as a non-repeatable read. When a transaction reads the same data twice, but gets different results because another transaction modified the data in between. Next up, we have repeatable reads. Now this isolation level ensures that within a transaction, the data read will not change even if other transaction modify or insert new data. So this isolation level provides a higher degree of data consistency compared to read committed 
and read uncommitted. So say in this example, T1 initiates a transaction to read the prices. Yeah, so it's reading the price this time. Meanwhile, another user initiates a separate transaction to update this price. So transaction one reads the list of prices. It sees the price of 999. And while transaction one is still active, transaction two updates the price of this product to 1000. Now, despite the update made by transaction two, when transaction one rereads the price, it sees 999 still. This, in essence, is repeatable reads. So the data that transaction one initially read remains consistent throughout its duration, even if another transaction modifies that. And this is going to prevent dirty reads seen in read uncommitted and also non-repeatable reads, which are present in read committed, but it can still encounter phantom reads. Then lastly is serializable. This is the highest isolation level, ensuring the highest degree of data integrity and consistency. So in this level, transactions are executed as if they were the only transactions within the system. So avoiding all anomalies like dirty reads, non-repeatable reads, and phantom reads. So in the process of updating the data, transaction one would first start its operations, and it would update the price of 999 to 1000. And only when this has been committed, can transaction two start its flight. And achieving serializability often involves more complex tasks like locking data, which can lead to reduced concurrency and potentially slower performance. So as we've discussed these isolation levels, you might have noticed a trade-off between concurrency and data consistency. So lower isolation levels allow for higher concurrency, making the system faster, but at the cost of potential data consistency issues. In contrast, higher levels prioritize data consistency which can slow down transaction processing. So it has the lowest level of concurrency. So choosing the appropriate isolation level is a crucial decision in your application. It involves finding the right balance between maintaining data consistency and achieving optimal concurrent performance. And this choice should align with the specific requirements of your application. So we know relational databases offer a well-established and structured way to manage and store data, maintaining data integrity with ACID properties, but they do come with some drawbacks. With the main one, in scalability and flexibility. So although they can be adapted for horizontal scalability, they may not be as naturally suited for this purpose as alternative databases.